you and I were up in Grass Valley ish area this weekend at my brother's house. And when you drive up there, you pass Rockland. And you went, I've never covered a training camp at Rockland, but the Niners had their training camps there from 1981 to 1997, Dad. Kind of an interesting timeline. Yeah, Seems that like all five of their Super Bowl victories started with a training camp in Rockland at Sierra Community College. Sierra College. Um, yeah. I have to say, I covered, when they were there, every one of those training camps. And it was really special. First of all, what was special? The team got away from the Bay Area. They lived in dormitories. Um, the players, Joe Montana, they lived in dormitories. Mm -hmm. They ate in the cafeteria. There were no mm -hmm. students around at that time. That was the deal. Um, and I don't think it's a coincidence, Iggy, that that's the five Super Bowls. And they got out of town. They weren't, I mean, and now the Niners stay at the Marriott around the corner, but they were out of town. It was like a sleepaway camp. It was like what the Niners do for like a few days during the season. Yeah, and they bonded and cliche, they became a team. Right. Became a team. And, you know, the Niners have been talking about this quest for six. We talked about that last week. And, you know, they always start slow in the season. They don't really do much. They have, they have a training camp at home. They don't play their starters in the preseason. They come out real slow, uh, and they don't really figure out who. They don't really become a team until October. They're not really a team until October. Well, the whole idea of going to Rockland is to become a team in August, right? And they did. I mean, they did. There was uh, things I'll never forget. Joe Montana, one of the guys. Remember, they didn't have computers. They had a playbook, and it was sort of like a scarlet-colored playbook, a, a binder. Everywhere I saw Joe Montana in the mess hall, walking around, he had the book. It, it was like an appendage, and he was studying it all the time. There was serious work that got done there. Um, I'm not saying they don't get serious work done in Santa Clara, but it's different. I used to remember Bill Walsh used to go from, he was, lived in a dorm also. He had a suite in the dorm, and he used to go. He had a, a bicycle. He used, you know, with those thick balloon tires, Iggy. Mm -hmm. he, I mm -hmm. think he even had a little bell, a little and beach cruiser, to, like you, a like beach you, cruiser. Uh, drive around and, Venice Bre Beach. Yeah, and he used to drive around. And if I was walking, he'd stop and he'd, you know lean over on his bike, and we'd talk. It was very casual. You really got to know the players from a media point of view. It was phenomenal, Iggy, because yeah. you didn't have to say, C "Could I get into the locker room?" They were there. Now, theoretically, you weren't supposed to eat with them in the dining room. But everybody was together. You talked to everybody. Everybody was cool. Um, Dwight Clark, he, you know, he was walking out to the field after lunch. Hey, Lowell, walk with me. Uh, what's going on? Iggy, from a media point of view, it was heaven. And it created a team in August, as you said, yeah. not in yeah. October. And I think it's probably easier for the team because they don't have to move equipment to stay in right. Santa Clara. But there was something to be said for going to Little Sierra College and winning five Super Bowls. And I'm sure the players don't want to do it now. The players are super rich, and that's Sierra College. But what the Niners do now is they ease into the season. You know, like that's not the way to set the tone for a Super Bowl victory. It's just not. If you want to win the Super Bowl, why not you set the tone immediately and get ahead of the rest of the league in August? Again, that's the, that's the goal. Otherwise, you're not going to be the number one seed. You're not going to have the bye week. You're not going to have home field advantage. I agree. What they yeah. do is they enter in the shallow end, not the deep end. They just put their big toe in. Yeah, it's like, ooh, that's, that's <laughs> too cold for me. Yeah. Why don't we just ease in and it'll, my, our, we'll get used to it. Freaking dive in in August. Go to Rockland. It's two hours away. Yeah. 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 So, man, tell kids, my... Okay. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Do you? What I wanted to say was, do you have any good stories from when they were back in Rockland? I want to tell my Charlie Young story. Okay, cool. <sighs> Charlie Young was a hell of a tight end. He was from the Central, he is from the Central Valley, he lives up in uh, Seattle now, and he went to SC. So one year, and I don't remember which year because there were so many of them, they were going to move him out for Russ Francis, who was another hell of a tight end. And Charlie was pissed. He could see the writing on the wall. And, he, and so 
he, I said, Charlie, um, could I do a little article with you? He said, sure, Lowell. It was, you know, Iggy, it was so simple in those days. You didn't have to go to the PR guy. Charlie, right. got a minute. So Charlie says, you know, Lowell, there's a stream down here. It'd be nice. It's a hot day. Why don't we go sit by the stream? I just love Charlie Young. Yeah. So we're sitting on the rocks, and while we're chatting, I happen to see a crayfish on the rocks. You know, probably in Louisiana, they call it a crawdad or a crawfish. And so I said to Charlie, oh, Charlie, look, there's a crayfish. He goes, no, no, that's a lobster. <laughs> so I said, you know, Charlie, I don't think you're right about that. Um, lobsters, as far as I know, are saltwater animals, and crayfish are freshwater animals. That's a crayfish. He goes, no, no, no. That's a lobster. So we had this debate, and a large part, if not all of my column on Charlie was a debate about lobster crayfish. And he was really serious, okay? Uh -huh. After the article came out, and I saw him X number of months later, he comes over. He, hey, Lowell, how you doing? I said, hi, Charlie. He goes, I know it was a crayfish. I was just messing with you. And it, Iggy, it, it was like that, okay? It was yeah. like that there. You yeah. could go and argue about whether it was a lobster or a crayfish with this yeah. fabulous tight end. And I want you to know something about tight ends. I got something to say. I first met Charlie Young when they were training in Redwood City. They weren't in mm. Santa Clara. Mm. I, and I lived in Palo Alto at the time, and I, I went out. I stayed late because you could hang around the locker room afterward. I used to hang around in the locker room and talk to Joe, Ronnie yeah. Lott. So it was dark. And I go toward my little car, and there's Charlie Young going to his car in the same parking lot, you know? Right. Can you imagine? I know. And he, he says, hey, Lowell. I want to convert you to Christianity. <laughs> I said, I, I said, right here? You yeah, right in the parking lot. He says, right here? Well, I said, you know, I'm a Jewish right guy. So I know, yeah. I know you're a Jewish guy. Uh, I said, and some, I, I don't think you have much of a chance here. He goes, okay. And I had his arms up. Okay, but we can get along, can't we? We can be friends. And we just had such a good time in the dark talking yeah. about all kind of things. And whenever I see Charlie now, he said, remember that night in the parking lot? He, this might have been like 1981, 1982. Almost got you. Almost, Almost got, you, got on the, you on the team. Yeah, yeah. I That's just really love him. Um, Russ Francis, when he retired, he wrote me a handwritten note about it was so much fun to work together. Brent Jones, he and I are in touch. And you know what a delightful, you know from when you were a kid, so I mm -hmm. want to say, you could make a case that the most delightful people on a football team are the tight ends. I'm going to make one exception. Kittle may be delightful, but he tries too hard to be delightful. To be delightful, yeah. He tries to be Vernon delightful. Davis was genuinely delightful. Oh, God, I want to talk he about He was genuinely you. delightful. Absolutely. What a guy. I, yeah. I'm going to tell the Vernon. I, lo I love Vernon Davis. Yeah, me too. Oh, I love him. How do you not what love I, Vernon Davis? Yeah. Who, how could you not love him? How could you Davis? not love Vernon Davis? Yeah. So I think I've told you what I, they used to do media guides. Now it's all online. The media guide really was quite a work of art. Yeah. And I have a whole bunch of them in my office. The last section was called personal. Mm -hmm. And it would tell you what their hobbies were, where they had grown up, what their interests are, that kind of thing. And what they majored in in college. Mm -hmm. And I, the minute I got that media guide, I would go through personal and see, is there anyone here who interests me? Well, I got to Vernon Davis. I didn't know him. He was a tight end. And it said he was a, an art major at Maryland. Yeah. So I went up to him and I said, it said studio art. That's what it said. Yeah. And I said, and you know, you could always approach him, Maggie. He was the most yes. delightful person. Yes. What does studio artist mean? He said, I'm a painter. I said, oh, my God, really? I said, do you have paintings where you live now in, in San Jose? He said, I do. I said, would you come with them and put an exhibition so I could bring a photographer from the Press Democrat, get you to speak about each of these paintings, and I'll write an article. Oh, Iggy. He comes down the next day all across the back lawn, not, not by the fields, but by where they eat, the back lawn. He had... Uh, you know, those, what do you call them? Things set up where you put a painting mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. um, maybe Whatever seven paintings. Yeah. And 
he just went around everyone told me what it was what other painters had influenced him what you know renaissance art interested him and i'm going to tell you and i've told you this i'm going maybe with him for an hour and it was fascinating only two players came out to look at his art only two of the whole team patrick willis and frank gore i believe they it. came with me yeah he, he did an art tour with me my photographer Patrick Willis and Frank Gore. That was one of the yeah. greatest experiences I've ever had. And, and I love Vernon Davis for that. I interviewed Vernon Davis about his art when I was about 24, 25. And he didn't do the whole thing, but he showed me one that he wrote, that he made when he was younger. Um, he showed it on, on, his, on my laptop. And he had half of his face covered in shadows. I've seen And that. I asked him, and I was like, well, what's that? Like, why, why did you, what does that mean to you? Why did you do that? And he, he, he said, you know, I've, I've actually thought about that. And he says, I think when I was younger, I was a lot more angry. That's what he said. Oh. That was so interesting. I think when I was younger, I had a lot of anger in me. It's like, wow, you really are an artist. Yeah. Yeah, you really are. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, Vernon Davis.